I want to welcome Susan Mendelson, who started many, many years ago in Vancouver with her small uh, shop on 4th Avenue Catering Company, which is now quite an esteemed, quite a big catering company. And she's got lots and lots of cookbooks and lots and lots of really interesting projects. So welcome, Susan. Well, those are two very hard acts to follow. So I'm not sure how we're going to do here, but thank you. Um, both women, both who have spoken today already, have been tremendous inspirations to me. And we, I just realized we have another thing in common. I don't have any training as well as a chef and, uh, or as a businesswoman, and I'll tell a little bit of that story. But uh, I just wanted to just put some of that together. And the inspiration that started me with my business was my grandmother was a fabulous, fabulous cook and a fabulous baker. And she came, um, we, we had a conversation when she was in her early 80s. And she said, you know, she had always wanted to have a little tea house with a little bakery. And it was just her dream to do it. But the timing wasn't right. And she had a big family of kids. And she just didn't do it. And I thought, I was a graduate social worker. I had a degree in social work, and uh, I worked at the Vancouver East Cultural Center, as some of you may know. And I just thought, you know, I don't really want to be 80 years old and have regrets. I don't want to say to my grandchildren, this is what I wish I had done. And I was so passionate about food, and I thought, you know what? I don't have anything to lose. I don't have any family or kids who are going to suffer. I'm just going to go and bite the bullet and go into the food business. and. If I fail, I can always go back to social work, which I never did. In fact, I kind of thought, well, maybe I'll do social work three days a week and just work at the Lazy Gourmet for four days a week, and then I can pay my expenses. But anyway, that didn't happen. So here's the speech I started to write for tonight. Good evening. <laughs> and thank you, Richard, for inviting me to come with this incredible group of passionate women who are to celebrate food. Since the Lazy Gourmet is about to celebrate its 35th Christmas season this year, I thought I would take the opportunity to do my personal reflection of the last 35 years of the history of food in this city. The Lazy Gourmet was designed to be exactly as it named, its name suggests. Our purpose in the beginning was to create gourmet food for people who were too lazy to make it themselves. People would bring their dishes to the Lazy Gourmet, and my, my former partner, Deborah Reutberg, and I would fill their dishes, their casserole dishes, with the food that we'd make. And our customers would take their dishes home, and they would pretend that they made it themselves. <laughs> and it worked. And it started a trend in Vancouver. Uh, and there was one other person, and I believe Becky Paris is in the room at this very moment, who was doing it at about the same time as us. And, um, Anyway, but Deborah and I both, and so I, my hat's off to you, Becky, because you did such a fabulous job with such panache and flair, and you were just so <laughs> fabulous and gorgeous. <laughs> anyway, back to the speech. Anyway, Deborah and I loved food. We loved to cook. We loved to bake. And it seemed like such a good idea. And what about if we could actually make a living doing something that we loved to do and felt passionate about? But as those of you who are in the business know, and we've heard a little bit about it tonight, it takes perseverance and fortitude that makes to make, make a business work. And it does take a tremendous toll on people, on relationships. It certainly can. Deborah and I, in the early days, worked 18 hours, sometimes 20 hours a day for that first year. And at the end of the first year, we hired a dishwasher. And we thought we had died and gone to heaven. Because before that, we had, we'd done all the cooking. We'd, we'd start at about, uh, well, we'd start doing food late at night. So we'd, we'd go into the Lazy Gourmet at about 6 in the morning, and we'd do our final prep and get everything finished up. And we'd open the doors at 9, and customers would come in, and the food was mainly made. But we'd be running back and forth, cooking and baking and bringing the food out. And, um, and then the doors would close at 6 o'clock. And uh, we, you know, go to the cash register and see how we'd done that day. We were so excited, like three hundred dollars! Oh my God, isn't that fabulous? And um, then we'd have to clean up everything from the day and then start doing all our food prep for the next day. And we'd go home. I mean, we'd, we'd, our deal was we had to wash the floor at night, 
And um, we'd go home at one or two in the morning and we'd be back at six. And we did that for a long time. And I actually got kind of sick for a bit, but I got through it. Um, anyway, so it was exhausting, but guess what? It was so exhilarating and it was fun and it was exciting. And people would come, actually friends would come and hang out with us at, uh, you know, midnight, just hanging out, you know, because they were coming home from parties and they could see the lights were still on and we were cooking in the back. It was kind of pathetic, but anyway. <laughs> um, so after the first year, we were firmly established. Our loans were completely paid off. And, but we didn't have much <laughs> to start. I'll tell you about that in a second. It was time to get new loans and to make our storefront look interesting because what we had done is we bought a lease called the Bean and Cream, which was an ice cream and coffee place. And we just kept the old ice cream coolers there and we balanced our big sheet pans on there with our food on them. And that was our decor. And that was what we did until the health department said something has to be covered up. <laughs> that was the beginning. So, so I went to New York City to the Silver Palette and came back inspired. We hired an architect got a new boat, another bank loan, created a whole new look for the company, and we started to brand ourselves. At the end of the first year, Mama Never Cooked Like This, my first book came out, and that brought a whole lot more attention to the company. Uh, I'm a lot older than a lot of people in this room, but when Mama Never Cooked Like This came out in 1980, the fall of 1980, it had a first run of 8,000 copies, and it was sold out the day before it opened. So it was all pre-sold. And it was just a, a story in, in you know, food in Canada. It was a tacky-made book. It was like the cheapest paper imaginable. The only picture, and it was my cover picture of me in a schmutta, let's just say. Zonda Nellis came into the, the restaurant and said, you know, Susan, if you're going to have your picture on the cover of cookbook, you better learn how to dress. And I say it could have gone either way. Zonda and I became best friends, but it could have gone in either direction. Um, but by the end of the first year, I realized that I knew nothing about business and that if we were, I mean, our passion had just taken us there um, and that if we were going to grow, I would have to educate myself. So we hired a consulting team who specialized in hotel and restaurants and we started to hire people who were better than us at just about everything. And after over a period of time, we brought those consultants back every two years for a 10 year period. And the idea was that um, that was the only way we were going to grow. Uh, so by the end of the first year, our business had been established, our culture had been established, and the blueprint for how the Lazy Gourmet would grow was now in progress. And I started to develop my own philosophy for managing business, which I will tell you about. So I wrote this little speech, and that um, I looked at it, and I just finished my end of the first year, and I was already at three minutes. And Richard told me I had 10 minutes. So I thought, what am I going to do? I cannot go through 35 years of history. So I thought, well, what I would do, and I reread what I wrote in like, the first year of business, and I realized that everything that I did after, between that first year and 35, was that it was all set up right in here. I did it, it was all there. It just grew. So I wanted to pick out what I'd written about for that first year and present it to you about kind of my philosophy of business and how I got to survive 35 years in this business. So number one, love what you do. Passion has energy and force, and it will sustain you during all those very, very difficult times. As long as you're passionate and you hold on to your passion, and let's face facts, it's really easy to be passionate about food because food is just, it's just so delicious, and you can make it more and more and more delicious with new ideas and getting other people's ideas and throwing them together. It's endless, and it, it really never ends. Work hard, that's two, work hard, play hard. So the early days are work hard and play hard. Now, it sounded to you, you know, just work hard, um, but play hard came in pretty fast as well, because when you work really hard, you have to play very hard. <laughs> but that can only last for so long, because then you start to age, and playing hard can also age you. <laughs> so I say, <laughs> and working too hard can age you too. So once you get to a certain stage past the work hard, play hard, is you have to find balance. And 
uh, by the time I ended up starting to have a family, I mean, my hus I met my husband, and uh, you know, we started dating, and he thought it was pretty cool. He thought I was pretty cool. He had a son who we brought. I did a, a children's. Uh, when my second book came out, uh, called Let Me in the Kitchen, I did a song and dance cooking show at the International Children's Festival, and he had actually brought his son to my show, which I just thought was so great because the children's festival is my favorite thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I'm really a frustrated actress. But anyway, um, I did study acting. I just was on the stage in uh, Nora Ephron's Love Loss and What I Wore. And um, I did that at the Arts Club a few weeks ago, a presentation house. We're doing that for fundraisers right now. If anybody's interested, come talk to me. Okay, that's another thing. And um, so balance, balance. Is, and so, so anyway, so my husband finally, I was about eight and a half months pregnant. And um, I came into the house at about 8.30 at night, and he and Soleil, my stepson, were kind of waiting for dinner, and my husband said, so when do you think you're gonna kind of become a normal person and like get into this domesticity kind of thing? Because, you know, this baby's coming in about a week. Anyway, I figured it out. And uh, yeah, so I decided to find a little bit of balance in my life, which was really, really paid off in a big way. But always have fun. So we're still at work hard, play hard, Balance, fun, that's number two. Number three, be creative. Um, and don't, and, and have, fun, like, have fun and be funny. Like, don't be afraid of being silly. That, the whole thing about the lazy gourmet is like, people thought, well, that's a stupid name. Like, and it was like, yeah, but you kind of remembered it. Like, it's, it doesn't make any sense, because people say, well, you're not lazy. You're like, you know, you're the least lazy person I know. You know, think about it. It was like for you, you're the lazy one and you're coming here. <laughs> so we kind of got that, got that kind of figured out. So then we've got number, uh, yeah, four, I, I didn't, I stopped numbering them. Fiscal responsibility. Pay off your loans. Get more, reinvest. Put everything back into your business. At the beginning, you just have to keep putting it back in your business. Uh, the reason we were able to pay off our loans is that Deborah and I took $500 a month for a long, long, long time. We paid our rent, we ate the food at the Lazy Gourmet, we had no other lives, so it didn't matter. <laughs> um, but get a good credit rating, because banks can be really, really, really nasty. And uh, the Lazy Gourmet is very successful, but we've had our ups and we've had our downs, and we've come close. The bank has kind of called and said, hey, we want to see your, you know, we want all the list of all your receivables because your line of credit's going up, and it's like, fuck you. <laughs> But anyway, we got through it, and uh, anyway, that's so, yeah. So the banks are really nice to you when you have lots of money in the bank, but you know, when you're in your line of credit, they can be super nasty. Travel. Get ideas from elsewhere. Bring them back. Pretend they're your own. <laughs> it's a great way to be, look really sexy. Um, uh, so yeah, so that first year I went, I went to uh, New York, as I said, and went to the Silver Palette. Came back and like, man, we were sexy. That was very cool. <laughs> and there was a couple of sexy dames. <laughs> Never rest on your laurels. You are only as good as your last party, and you'll always only be as good as your last party, and you have to constantly be going forward and thinking ahead. Um, and the only way to do that is constantly reinvent yourself over and over and over again. We were on 4th Avenue. From 4th Avenue, we went to Thurlow. We went to Granville Island. I became, I went to 6th Avenue, ended up with a restaurant, um, continued with the catering, and always tried to come up with new ideas, new branding. Um, but you won't be successful with everything you do. I mean, it was... Uh, I remember at one point the Lazy Gourmet had been doing well, 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 well. All of a sudden we've got Granville Island, we've got um, Thurlow and Robson, and I'm sitting with my accountant and I said, you mean to tell me that we did $150,000 this month and we lost money? To go, yes, you did because your rent is now 100 times more than it was before and blah, blah, blah. So it's like, oh, maybe I better learn to be a businesswoman. So you won't be successful every time, but you, if you've perseverance, hard work, get your nose to the grindstone, you'll make it work, it comes through. Because in the end, one of the most important things is to trust your intuition. Your intuition, and I really strongly believe this, your intuition will give you your answers. You just have to trust yourself, and you will find the answers yourself. Um, and if you trust in yourself, 
And so that's a, something that I learned along the way that has really, really been very powerful for me. Um, mistakes that I've made along the way were mainly many because I did not trust my intuition. Media, um, keep them interested in you. Cookbooks, 10 cookbooks, cookbook, cookbook, cook, cook, cookbook. Every time you, uh, the media is, you know, they're going to be kind to you. You're a local, come out with a cookbook, do the, you know, go do the circuit, keep people interested in you, and know how to work with the media. So that if you're going to do four interviews in a day, you make sure that for each interview, you have a different theme. You're not going to go to the Global Mail and CTV and Global and give them the same story because you won't be invited back. And so each person gets their own story. And uh, I'll just tell you a funny story. Margaret Atwood is my uncle, my aunt's, no, my uncle's sister. And she was in Vancouver. She's a famous Canadian author. She was in Vancouver when I first started the Lazy Gourmet, and she came to the, the you know, came to my storefront. She sat with me, and she said, "I'm going to tell you one thing. When you have an interview with the media, whatever they ask you, you go in ahead of time, and you tell them in your mind, you know what you want to say, and whatever they ask you, you just keep with your theme about what you want to tell them." And it was. I mean, that was like the best bit of advice they ever had. I always went into a media interview with a theme and a focus, and with all the cookbooks, they always asked me back. I always had prime time, and I was, you know, was really, really lucky. Uh, let's see. So media then went from, you know, we were doing events all the time, but now, and shows, now it's gone to social media. And social media is what my new hip people do, because you have to keep hip and sexy and I'm 61 years old, so I hire a hip sexy people. Um, lifetime learning. If you can't go to school, bring the school to you. Those consultants I said to you earlier came back every two years for 10 years to help with the company, and it was the only way that we could grow to the next level. I could not have done it on my own. There's not a, not a chance. And then the next thing is technology. So the Lazy Gourmet was the first catering company to have a fax machine. It was a very big deal. Of course, we had nobody to talk to with the fax machine because no other catering company had it. But, but the companies downtown did, and we got ahead of it. And then Peterson's, like you have to realize, we dealt with Peterson's, and there's lots of other rental companies. But when we wanted to place an order, we would say, OK, this is Susan Mendelson at the Lazy Gourmet. I have a party going to so-and-so. You'd spell out the name. The address, you'd spell it out. Okay, 12 forks, uh, that's forks, that dinner fork. And you, you would go through the list of everything you needed. And then you'd get off the phone and like they couldn't send it back to you for verification because like we, before fax machines. So then we had the fax machine. So that kind of got us right to a new level. We could work faster, we could work smarter. Then we got a computer. Wow, first catering company with a computer, and then we were the first catering company with a cell phone. Oh my god. <laughs> this is just telling you how old I am. First catering company with a website, and the first catering company to design our own custom software. And the custom software is really what separated us at the time. I mean, there are lots of fabulous catering companies, and they've come up and they've moved fast, but having our own software company kept us really on top of things for a long time. Um, so we, so yeah, so we were really lucky with that. And then, um, I'm getting there, I hope I'm not taking up too much time, we're almost there. I can't keep my track here, but giving back, and uh, everyone's really talked about giving back too. We've, we've had, over the years, partnerships with the Arts Club Theatre, um, I've been on the board of Big Sisters for 17 years, and we're very involved with what we do with Big Sisters. Um, Covenant House is our, I mean, we, we take food to the shelters into Covenant House, and, but we have great partnerships with them. Dr. Peters, um, it, it kind of goes on and on, but we, those things, we, we love to give back, and we think, I really, really believe strongly that you get so much more back than you ever give. And uh, we've been, you know, we've, we really feel committed. The company has a policy, we don't say no to anybody who asks. We have some lower priced items that we give away and we have stacks of some things and, um, but for the larger items, you know, we give them annually or every, every second by annually. Um, but we, it's really important to us to not say no when people ask us. 
um, stay current, stay fresh. And that's why I hire people who are smarter than me, who are hipper than me, who are, um, yeah, yeah, who just know what's going on with this, like tweeting and Instagram and, you know, keeping, and wow, keeping it all happening because it's like, I have to phone my 23 year old daughter and say, how do I do this with my iPad? And she goes, mom, I'm not telling you one more time. You're making me crazy. Anyway, so number one, hire people who are smarter than you. Be nice to people who are on their way up because you might meet them when you're on your way down. <laughs> Trust in your instinct, we talked about that. Own your mistakes, and that's something for, important for me for my staff as well. If you, I mean, I just say you need to be able to own your mistakes. It's not the mistakes you make, it's how you cover. We're always working for the same boss, and our boss is our client. And I'll cover for you today, and you cover for me tomorrow. But if you can't own that you've made a mistake, then you'll continue to make those mistakes over and over again, so it's not a good place for you to work at our place. Um, yeah, I've got that. So what do I do now? Okay, we're at the last one. I'm 61 years old. I never thought I'd still be working at this age, at this at my age, but I'm the company stronger than it's ever been, and I'm happier than I've ever been with the work that I do. I love it. I work now three days a week, which is just like unbelievable. It's a dream come true. Um, and the reason that I'm lucky is because I have a phenomenal team of people. My chef's been with me 17 years. My HR guy's been with me 21 years. Um, I've got a young general manager who I hired as my assistant uh, a number of years ago, and he moved on to general manager very quickly because he's just really damn smart. And I uh, just have a, a wonderful, wonderful team of people who are com tremendously supportive. Um, I asked Kevin today what you know, what, what he, how he thought and why he thought the company continued to be successful. And he said it's about, because the, the people who work there believe in the culture, they believe in, their, in the commitment to the company, and they feel really supported. They're my greatest resource, and my, go my goal is to make them feel appreciated at all times, and I see that that's how you feel too. And at the end of the day, if I've got a happy customer, happy staff, happy clients, happy suppliers and my happy family, then I can sleep well. Yeah, anyway, yeah. thank you very much.